Let's give it up for our next keynote speaker. Good morning. How did you know that Van Halen was one of my favorite bands? That was great. Appreciate that. So I've been leading uh, large design teams in the States for about 20 years. Um, uh, financial services, Vanguard, big mutual fund investment company, USAA, another financial service company, Capital One, uh, large credit card issuer. And for the past five years, I've been at Verizon, one of the US's uh, well, the U.S.'s largest telecommunications company, one of the world's largest communication companies. We uh, serve 130 million customers in the U.S. And although those companies are different, when you're leading large design teams, there are certain patterns that emerge. Right? The challenge is essentially the same for a design leader in a large organization. And that challenge is how to get from money to an experience. Now, when you're in a small organization, a startup, small team, you can just hire a couple of designers and say, design me an experience, <laughs> create me an experience, and that works. But when you're in a huge ecosystem, that doesn't work. It becomes more complex, and the patterns that have emerged, I've kind of codified into what I'm grandly calling uh, the ziggurat of impact which is this structure with these five layers that represent the different frameworks that we need to put together to get from money to an experience. And that's what Alexa and I are going to walk through today. Um, before we get to the first layer, I think it's important to recognize that one does not simply design experiences. And to explain that enigmatic statement, let me introduce my colleague, Alexa Curtis. Thank you, Richard. So before I get into that statement, just a quick bio to give some context. So at Verizon, I've, I've been here for about six years. I run a team called Digital Channels. The majority of my career, I've spent practicing as a digital product designer. But I've also practiced as a physical product designer, an environment, environmental designer, a packaging designer, graphic designer. Those are all kinds of design where you know they're really tangible. You can design a thing, you can write a spec, spec for a thing, you can manufacture the thing, you can VQA the thing, or QA the thing, right? It's repeatable, et cetera. But the funny thing is we run a team called Experience Design, and this is a user experience conference, and I'm guessing a lot of folks in the room, including all of the design team out here from Verizon, uh, we call ourselves experience designers. I think it's great. It's a common industry term, but it's also really funny to me, right? Because at the end of the day, no one is actually designing experiences. We're designing systems. Let me explain. So I believe that an experience is a personal outcome, right? It's a person, a unique human being in a unique situation. But to deal with their situation, to solve the problem at hand, they are interacting with the systems that they have access to, the systems around them. Now, that system might be a system that your company makes. From my perspective, it might be a system that Verizon is responsible for helping a customer in their time of need. And this is where it's kind of like the make it or break it moment for your brand, right? Does the system, do the systems that you've built show up and help a customer in that moment and create a moment of brand love? Or does the opposite happen, right? Do the systems fail? Do the systems not show up in a way that helps the person in their situation, right? So with that foundation, right, we design systems. We need to understand what systems do we design and what situations are we trying to account for to help our customers. At the scale of Verizon, there's a lot of situations where we're trying to help customers do a thing, right? To help them in 
a moment and to provide a great experience. I'm guessing folks in the crowd, the companies you're working for, also have a wide range of user needs that you're trying to support. So one of the questions is just at scale, how do we know what our systems are and how do we keep track of them? So this brings us to the first layer of the ziggurat, uh, the taxonomy, right? So the taxonomy is a fundamental way to break down the experience by naming the parts of the experience as you know, cross-chartered areas that can be monetized, staffed, uh, invested in, measured, right? Prioritized. So it's a, it's a foundational thing to have a vocabulary to talk about the parts of the experience that matter and the systems that we build to bring experiences to life. So I'm gonna take you through an example of the taxonomy that we've been creating at Verizon. I'm really proud of this work. Um, I'll keep it at a pretty high level because as the team knows, I can talk about this literally all day long. Um, so there's four main parts. I'm gonna start with consumer products. These are the things that customers want or need, right? The reason that they come to us for solving their problem, right? Um, it might be our mobile connectivity plans, our home internet connectivity plans, but we also have a variety of uh, other services around security, family, et cetera. Next is the touch points. This is looking at the things that we build, right? Whether it's uh, pixel-based, hardware-based, training-based, right? We've got, um, this is where the interaction happens in digital, retail, call centers, door-to-door -door experiences. We have shared capabilities. You can think of this as the back-end systems. If the touchpoint systems are the front-end systems, shared capabilities are the back-end systems. It's critical if you're a multi-channel or omni-channel organization that you invest in these shared capabilities so that your customers have a consistent experience and relationship with you and your company, whether they're working with, or whether they're interacting with one of your products, one of your touch points, et cetera, and the ability to move seamlessly across those. These are the uh, first three areas, and these are the areas of the taxonomy that we align our build teams to. Our agile teams support these areas, right? The final area of the taxonomy uh, is a little bit newer in, in terms of our, our addition, but it's, it really goes back to the situations at hand, right? Person in a situation with the systems, right? So the customer activities are added as a way of representing, like a customer wakes up in the morning and wants to do something with Verizon. What is that thing and how do we support them in their situation? Now. It looks like there's just five here. There's not just five. Uh, there's about 38 that we uh, have identified so far that we're uh, mapping out, understanding the real end-to-end -end here. Um, and it's important to understand the end-to-end -end of these different customer activities, because otherwise it's just kind of duplicative with the, um, with the other uh, built teams, right? The goal of the customer activity is to really see how all these different systems string together to help a customer. Um, so for example, if you're buying a phone, like it doesn't end when you leave the store with the phone, right? That purchase ends when you get maybe your first bill, maybe your second bill, when you start seeing the promo credits and things like that. So being able to see it all the way through. Um, one other example to help bring it together is like, let's say just one of, the, one of those customer activities is a customer needs to uh, replace their phone, right? Let's say they lost their phone. Not like lost it in the couch, but like dropped in the ocean. Like it, it's gone. Not a, not a good day for that person. So how are they going to recover? They're probably going to be, recover by coming into one of our stores, right? Let's make sure that those retail reps are trained to handle the situation with empathy and care and urgency. The rep is going to need to authenticate the customer to make sure that we can make updates on their account. Let's make sure that we don't use our standard two-factor authentication me uh, methodology of authenticating them by sending a text to the bottom of the ocean. That's not going to help, right? We need alternate methods within our shared capabilities of authentication to, to support them. And maybe this customer has device insurance, so they, they get their phone replaced basically for free. 
but we use a third party. So let's make sure that, that third party is integrated so the customer doesn't need to leave the store, that they can, in that session, uh, leave with a recovered device at no cost to them. No more hassle. So again, that's just an example of you know, where three different you know, teams at Verizon, you know, a team that's looking at the retail stores, our retail operations team, the team that's looking at authentication, which is a shared capability, and a team that's offering a consumer product, the uh, device protection, are all coming together at the same point in a customer's life, right? So having that customer activity helps provide context to each of those three teams that are each caring for their individual systems, how, uh, how to show up in a moment for a customer and helps give them better requirements for their product area. The customer activity lens is also really helpful in that it helps provide a sense of the different policies and procedures that a company has and how those policies end up contributing to the customer experience. And for an example, I'm going to pass it back over to Richard. Thanks, Alexa. Yeah, those, it's important to recognize, as Alexa said, that as great as this taxonomy is, it's actually just the tip of the iceberg when you think about a large organization. There's a lot of work that a large enterprise does beneath the water in the bottom of the iceberg around policies and pricing and business processes, HR, legal, like, you know, uh, procurement, training, that all can also have an effect on the customer experience. And to illustrate that, <clears throat> I think it's interesting to tell the story of Dr. David Dow. Dr. David Dow was... Uh, internet famous a few years ago, infamous maybe. He was trying to get from Chicago O'Hare Airport in the US to Louisville, Kentucky. And he was trying to take a United Airlines flight. It was the last flight of the day and it was fully booked. And United also needed to get four employees from Chicago to Louisville to crew a different flight out of Louisville. And so, <coughs> They asked for four volunteers to get off the plane. Remember, it was fully booked. The passengers were actually on the plane on the tarmac at this point. They said, hey, would anybody like to get off the plane? We'll put you up in a hotel. We'll give you a travel voucher for $300, and you can fly the next day. Nobody raised their hand. How about $600? Would anybody get off for $600? How about $1,000? Anybody get off for $1,000? Nobody. Everybody wanted to get out of Chicago and get back to Louisville. So United then said, OK, we're going to pick four of you, and we're going to tell you that you have to get off the plane. In the industry, they call this involuntary bumping. And so they, not quite randomly, I'm sure, I'm sure they didn't select any like 1K or Premier Platinum members. They picked four people and said, OK, get off. Three of them got off. Dr. Dow did not. He said, I have to get back to Louisville tonight. My medical practice in the morning, I have patients I need to see. I have to get back there tonight. So I'm not getting off. So United sent onto the plane some members of the O'Hare Airport Security Service who essentially assaulted Dr. Dow and dragged him unconscious and bleeding off the plane. Past everybody videoing it and live streaming it with their phones on the way. I think we can all agree this was not a great customer experience. It wasn't a great day for Mr. Dow. It wasn't a great day for the other passengers or the crew members. Certainly not a great day for United shareholders. It wasn't a great day for the United CEO, who at first actually blamed Dr. Dow and then had to apologize for that as well as the actual incident itself. <clears throat> but this situation wasn't caused by any of those uh, touch points, capabilities, products in the taxonomy that Alexa shared, it was caused by things in the bottom of the iceberg. Lack of training, policy and procedure. The fact that United could only offer up to $1,000, which sounds like a lot of money, but they could only offer up to $1,000 to entice somebody to get off the plane was a problem, the fact that they overbooked the plane in the first place and got the capacity management wrong. They've actually subsequently changed that $1,000 policy as a result of this incident. They can now offer, and have on rare occasions, up to $10,000 to 
to incentivize somebody to get off the plane. They never do that when I'm flying United, by the way, but I'm just waiting for that moment. <laughs> so it's important to recognize that there's a lot more that goes into a customer experience than even just the taxonomy that we, that we shared. So <clears throat> we have the taxonomy, but how do we know which of those systems are good and which are bad? Where are we meeting customer expectations? Where are we not meeting customer expectations? That's why we need the next layer of the ziggurat, a measurement layer. So we have a lot of measurements at, at Verizon, including NPS. Hands up if you know what NPS is. Keep your hand up if you'd recommend it to a family member or a friend. No? All right. So net, NPS, Net Promoter Score, um, I'm not going to go into it in great detail, but uh, it's a score between negative 100 and positive 100. <clears throat> and you get it by uh, asking a simple question of your customers, would you recommend this product to a family member or a friend? They score that on a 0 to 10 scale, and you get the NPS score by subtracting the detractors, those people that scored you 0 to 6, from the promoters, those people that scored you 9 or 10 and you ignore the neutrals, the, se the seven or eights in the middle. And you get this negative 100 to positive 100 score. Now, I'm not going to go into the <clears throat> virtues of NPS in a broader sense, but what I will say is that from a CX or UX perspective, it's not that helpful because it's huge. There's a lot that goes into NPS. Your pricing, your market fit, you know, recency bias, right? If somebody has a great experience, then, you know, yes, I would recommend somebody has a bad experience. No, like, <clears throat> it's not that helpful. But finding ways to causally tie whether or not your experience is good or bad to NPS is notoriously difficult. What we do instead, or as a complement to NPS, is that we have a whole bunch of other measures. CSAT, customer satisfaction score, digital interaction score, rep interaction score, product interaction score, and newer measures that we're coming up with, customer activity score, to measure those end-to-end -end customer activities and whether or not people are satisfied with getting done the thing they are trying to do. These are much more diagnostic. They help us understand, in isolation, was this specific interaction with a digital system or a, a, a store interaction or a phone interaction, was it successful? And as well as asking people, you can also examine behavior. A great question to ask is, what do satisfied customers do in our product? What is their behavior? Do they buy more? Do they tell people about it? Do they spend a long time in your product or a short amount of time in your product, depending upon which is better? Can you measure that and use that as an indication of health? The inverse question I find is actually even more impactful, which is what do dissatisfied customers do in our product? Do they leave? Do they complain? Do they switch channels? Right? They fail to do something on the web or in the app, so they call. Can you measure that and use that as an indicator of where there are problems in your product? So that's the, the measurement layer. Now, one of the things we use the measurement layer for is to help us prioritize. We cannot work on everything in the taxonomy all at once. That would be insane. And we, that wouldn't be a good return on investment for our resources. So what we need is a prioritized portfolio of work. So our portfolio of work is the next layer of the ziggurat. This is our kind of map of the universe, if you will. It's not important to read the, the boxes. Those boxes on the, on the left of this diagram represent the sales and service interactions of people buying and getting service for our products. Those boxes on the right represent the use experiences of people using our apps and services. This is everything the design team works on. And the color coding here indicates the level of resourcing we have in these different boxes. Black indicates nobody's working on that. Red, skeleton level staffing. Yellow, decent staffing, we're doing some substantial work. And green, 
fully staffed. We're really focused on it. This helps us have a whole bunch of different conversations, not least of which is, let's make sure we're aligned with our product management and engineering partners on how we're staffing these boxes. There's no point the design team staffing a box green, putting a whole bunch of people in it, if product management and engineering are going to make it red and black from their perspective, or vice versa. It also helps us have conversations about um, prioritization with our executive team. Right? Somebody, one of my executive colleagues comes to me and says, hey, I'm getting, you know, I've got some feedback, feedback about a particular box. I can say, well, that's great, but that box is black at the moment. I don't have anybody working there. And they can be like, well, you should put somebody to work there. I'm like, okay, tell me which of the yellow and green boxes I should make red or black to move people to this other box. We have a finite set of resources. We can distribute them how we like across this. Let's have that prioritization conversation. Now, the type of work also differs. That's not shown in this version of the diagram, although we've got other diagrams that show it, <clears throat> because obviously we do a range of work. We do visioning work where we're like, well, what should this system, what should this box be in two or three years? On the other end of the spectrum, we do optimization, right? We've got some bugs in, this, in the system, right? Short term, fixing problems. And in the middle, we've got lots of creation work, execution work, where we're adding new features or redesigning features. This helps us understand the different skill sets that we need across the team and also helps us understand the different types of funding we can use because we have both operational expense or OPEX and capital expense, CapEx dollars in that money box at the top that we can spend. And it's important because we can only spend certain types of money on certain types of work from a finance perspective. So that's <clears throat> our portfolio of work. In order to work there, we need repeatable ways of doing that work from a process perspective. And that's the next layer of the ziggurat that Alexa is going to talk about. So let's talk process. As a designer, I love the phrase form follows function, right? And I think that that works for process just as well as it does for a specific design. The different types of work that Richard just shared as far as vision work, creation, revolution, optimization, extension, et cetera. Um, each of those types of work, I believe, requires a different type of design process, a different stakeholder group, a different way of getting a big team or a small team all aligned and working together. So as we've been working on the taxonomy and rolling out the taxonomy and measurement and the portfolio structures, et cetera, we're also spending a lot of time working with partners around process and defining uh, our ways of working together. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the, uh, the details of that conversation, but I did bring four takeaways um, that we wanted to share with you that we think are really important and fundamental to bringing this all together. So the first uh, key idea is product over project. And by that, I mean product teams over project teams. So Specifically, the product teams are teams that are aligned with areas of the taxonomy, right? Areas of the experience that are evergreen and persistent that need ongoing love and care and attention as, and treated as a product that we maintain versus projects being the big things that the company wants to do, right? Uh, things that, you know, we probably need uh, lots of teams to weigh in on, in on and, and be involved in. So if we were approaching an initiative in a project-first mindset, we'd get a big group of people together, and they would probably go through a big waterfall process because of all the complexity. You need to kind of phase it out. With a product model, you can take a project, say, here's what we want to do, have a smaller team organizing and coordinating and orchestrating, and making sure that each of the product teams that have the expertise in their system area can bring that expertise to make that project a success. So building off of the um, product over project into the second one, making sure that those different product area teams have system responsibility and accountability uh, and have agile team resources to continue to improve their product area, right? So that means 
making sure that they're having a backlog, looking at their product every day, making sure it's working correctly, et cetera, that they have accountability and responsibility for that. Brings us to the next item, governance of global and local prioritization. So if you think of a product team's backlog, as local prioritization, right? That's the set of things that they want to do to improve their product area. They're also going to need to maintain capacity, open capacity to support various projects and initiatives that they're going to need to support from other teams, right? No agile team is autonomous at Verizon, or in my opinion, should be autonomous at any large organization. Uh, you really need to have a teaming mindset to show up for the customer, right? So we're looking at different models for governing and making sure that we're able to efficiently distribute the work in a way where you can take a project and bring it to a you know, significant number of teams to bring it to life. And then fourth, uh, we've got the roles, responsibilities, and of course, ratios conversation. So this is always an area where you know, as a company evolves into a more digital product mindset, um, getting everybody to move from old roles and processes into new roles and processes uh, takes some work and education. Um, the ratios are really critical as well. We want to make sure that we're not, as designers, investing a lot of uh, energy, uh, like designing a new thing that can't be built because we don't have engineering resources or the right engineering resources to build it, and vice versa. If we have a giant engineering team, but no designers or product owners to really help bring those things to market, it's not, it's not going to work out well for us. Um, so that is a good transition into our final uh, layer of the pyramid, and back over to Richard to talk about people. Thanks, Alexa. So people is arguably the most important layer. All of this uh, is great, but you need a great team and great people to execute this. So many different things to think about uh, from a people layer of the ziggurat. I've just listed a, a handful here. Diversity, hugely important. Right? We, diversity means a lot of different things uh, and, and in a lot of different locations. Uh, in particular, in the US, one of the things we're very aware of and conscious and focused of is racial diversity, making sure that we have uh, appropriate representation and equitable treatment on our teams, particularly uh, encouraging um, uh, our teams from a black designer perspective and black design leader perspective, where we have opportunities. Here in India, maybe we think a little bit more about gender diversity, making sure that our teams have appropriate representation of great women uh, design individuals and women design leaders. I'm happy to say that our women design leadership team in uh, our design leadership team here in India is about 50-50 from a male-female uh, perspective. So there's some amazing women leaders on our team here. Geography. Uh, Lex and I uh, have been uh, in uh, Hyderabad yesterday, and uh, Chennai the day before that, and including here in Bangalore. Uh, those are our three locations in India where we have design teams. In the US, it's mainly based in New York and New Jersey in the Northeast, <clears throat> a couple of other smaller teams in, in other cities as well. And we think about what the appropriate work is to do in each of those locations. We have centers for excellence, right? Our teams here in India, as well as focusing on the external customer experience, um, pay particular focus on the internal employee experience with our assisted experiences. We also have a great center for excellence of front-end engineering, front-end development here, and so we care a lot for our Verizon design system from a design and engineering perspective here in India. We have lots of different labor types. We leverage full-time employees, contractors, agency engagements. Um, in fact, actually, we are, over the past few years, we've been a little uh, overrepresented in contractor and uh, agency engagements uh, around the our employee base has basically been around 30%-ish from a full-time employee perspective, which we think is way low for a large internal design team. We've actually been hiring 180 designers this year globally, both here and in the US, uh, and we'll get that ratio to about 50, 55% by the end of the year and probably continue it. We want to be in the 70% range from a full-time employee perspective. So lots of hiring going on, FYI. There's a booth out there. Um, 
lots of all the, all the regular skill sets that you would expect represented, you know, interaction design, visual design, information architecture, content strategy, front end engineering, as I mentioned, uh, research and insights, usability testing, and a whole bunch of others that I'm, that I'm not mentioning. Um, <clears throat> we also want to create a great culture of design, a culture of curiosity, a culture of learning, a culture of growth, where all of our design team members can feel challenged and, and that they're learning new things and that they are all uh, feeling like they can belong in the team. Um, and then performance management. One of my uh, bosses many years ago <clears throat> said to me, Richard, feedback is a gift. I think he was giving me some feedback at the time, but um, still true. And I've tried to live my life by that. <clears throat> the important thing to recognize, though, when you're in a large team is that the feedback you're giving a, design, a lead designer over here being managed by Adam is the same as the feedback you're giving by a, a lead designer over here managed by Alex. You need to be consistent with our expectations. And so it's important for the managers to cl uh, calibrate their understanding of what performance means and what the expectations of a lead designer is. One of my former design operations leaders, Indra Clavins, wrote a great blog, blog post about the internal calibration process we developed a few years ago. I put the link here, you'll see it in the materials, it's worth a read. So that's the last layer of the ziggurat, right? That's how you get from money to experience. You need a great team working on repeatable best practices from a process perspective, working on a prioritized portfolio of work, informed by knowing what is good and what isn't from a measurement perspective, all based upon a solid understanding of what the systems are from a taxonomy perspective. The last thing I will say is that this doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen without effort. You need, since I mentioned design operations, you need a solid design operations team uh, to invest in that design operations team to put this, these layers in practice. But that investment pays off very quickly because it keeps the designers doing what they do best, which is designing. Thank you for listening.